Okay, with tensile testing, um, obviously we, we test a sample in tension and then there's a number of things we need to be aware of. Before we do a tensile test or indeed any mechanical test, especially if we're working with a, um, a material like wood, which is a, a reactive material really because it reacts to its environment. So before we test any piece of wood, we have to uh, go through a conditioning phase uh, and the standards will tell you how to do this, but if you don't do it properly, then you'll end up with different results depending on what conditioning history you use to prepare the sample. So if you take a sample from a wet state and dry it down, you'll have a different property compared with if you have it from a dry state and wet it up, take it back up. So you might have, um, in the standard it might say condition at 65% relative humidity and 20 degrees centigrade or whatever the standard says. Uh, but if you take a dry sample and condition it up, you're going to get a different result than if you get a wet sample and condition it down. So it's very important that before you condition, you precondition. So the history of a wood sample will affect its properties. This is very well known, very well understood. Uh, and there is, uh, if you read the literature, you'll find when people are doing sorption properties, for example, they talk about erasing the previous history. And you do that by going through a preconditioning phase before you do the conditioning, whatever that might be, and then before you do the measurements, whether it's sorption measurements or mechanical measurements. So it's very important to emphasise that you need to get this conditioning right. So that's the first thing. And this applies to all testing of biological samples, really, not just wood, because conditioning. So get that right. Now, I don't know what the standards say, but they will tell you something about relative humidity and temperature, what you must use in order to get uh, the samples in the same state. So you're comparing like with like. The other thing you have to be aware of when you're working with wood is the grain orientation. So if I was doing a tensile test, for example, and this is a typical tensile test specimen, what's called a dumbbell specimen, we want the grain to be running along the axis of the tensile test. If we have the grain running off at an angle, we're going to get a different measurement compared with if we measure it parallel to the grain. So we have to get the grain orientation right. With small samples, we don't want to have knots present. So that means we'll be working with what are called small clears. When we're measuring tensile properties, but this applies to, again, any mechanical test, we're going to be measuring a force against a displacement, unless it's an impact test. So we need something that's going to measure a force and for that you need to have uh, a device that can measure force, basically. Um, so that's called a load cell in these instruments. And you've got to have some way of measuring displacement and that's where, again, you can have all sorts of errors creeping in. Displacement. And to measure a displacement, we use something called a strain gauge, which I will. There's two spellings of strain gauge. There's might be a European spelling and an American spelling, so you'll find either of those spellings in the literature. Um, so we've got to measure the extension of this sample when we apply force to it. Now one way of doing that, these uh, are where you clamp the sample to the machine, so that's where the crossheads would go. Uh, 
And we are, we've deliberately necked this sample down because we want the failure to occur here. We don't want it to occur where the jaws are clamping. Typically where a jaw clamps a sample, um, because the jaw normally has serrations on it to stop the sample, sample slipping, uh, you might have premature failure at that point because you've introduced some sort of defect in the sample. Um, so you have to design the test sample in such a way that it doesn't slip in the jaws um, because you want the force that, or the displacement that the jaws are creating to be reflected in the displacement of the sample and you want the force that the jaws are applying to be reflected in your test part of the sample. So you don't want this slipping occurring. But nonetheless, the displacement of the jaws in the machine aren't necessarily going to be a measure of the displacement of the sample. So to measure um, the displacement of these crossheads is not an accurate way of getting the, uh, getting the stress strain properties. So that's why we use a strain gauge. Now you can have a strain gauge where you just put a couple of marks on the sample and you do an optical measurement. And that's a really nice way of doing it because it's a non-invasive way of measuring how that sample stretches as you apply a force. You can have a strain gauge that you clamp on and providing uh, the clamps don't interfere with the sample, so they need to be attached quite lightly to the sample, um, they will measure uh, the mechanical displacement, so like a, a clamped on strain gauge is more a mechanical one. You can have uh, like pizza electric ones which you stick to the sample. The problem with any sort of mechanical one, uh, it doesn't always occur, but there's always the possibility that either the way you've stuck it on, the adhesive itself isn't providing that, that movement quite right to the mechanical strain gauge or the strain gauge itself is, is moving independently of the sample, even ma microscopically. So really optically is, is the best way of doing it, but it's not always possible. So you have these choices, but like I say, you have to be aware that you're going to have inaccuracies if you're not very careful with these tests.